It was a case of being in the right place at the right time. It wasn't anything that we were familiar with in this area. A new species hiding in plain sight. It was a coincidence that I was not only interested in the general diversity of invertebrates, but also happened to be a specialist on worm snails. A non-native worm snail so well hidden, only an expert could spot it among the ever-growing marine fauna attaching to the shipwreck. They call it the Vandy. And that's because for now, it's only found in one place. We have not seen them anywhere other than the Vandenberg wreck. Changes may go unnoticed for a very long time because nobody looks at it. Specialist who knows the group may not be there. This worm snail is famous for its Spider-Man-like powers. They use these two-arm-like extra tentacles that only worm snails have to, at snail speed, shoot out slime threads. But the introduction of a new species to an environment can have dramatic consequences. Could this worm snail spread to other shipwrecks or coral reefs and start the next invasion? Will the native coral reef community suffer? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct and Ocean Divers. The Do Unto Others Trust. The Charles N. and Eleanor Knight Lee Foundation. And by the following. The Florida Keys are home to thousands of species of fish, marine mammals, and invertebrates. Over two million visitors come to the Keys each year, many of them to enjoy water sports like fishing, boating, and scuba diving. Within the Florida Keys lies a 2,800 square nautical mile area known as the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. It reaches out into the Atlantic Ocean, Florida Bay, and the Gulf of Mexico. The Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary has been in place since 1990. It was the first sanctuary to be established by an act of Congress. The sanctuary was established in response to the decline of the coral reef ecosystem in the area. Its creation protects the coral from damaging activities like oil exploration, mining, or any type of activity that could alter the seafloor. Here in the Keys, we have the world's third largest barrier coral reef. We have a tremendous amount of diversity. We have so many things to really celebrate. Yes, our corals are in trouble. They're in trouble around the world, but we're still seeing a lot of things that attract divers. One feature attracting divers to the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is the shipwreck trail a chain of nine wrecks dotted along the Florida coast. The last ship to have been added to the trail was the deliberately sunk USNS General Hoyt S. Vandenberg in 2009. It's located just seven miles off of Key West. One of the goals for this wreck was to take pressure off the natural reefs. The reason that we were looking at the Vandenberg and these other ships as important tools for management is that our reefs around the world are in trouble. We're in trouble with climate change, pollution, land-based source of pollution, habitat loss and destruction, overfishing, invasives. All these things are affecting our coral reefs. So why not try to put some places out to attract divers to where they can go, where it's a very hardy site for them to dive and explore. After the Vandenberg went down, it became one of the most popular dive sites in the Florida Keys and a brand new hotspot for the local fauna and flora to explore and colonize. No one could have predicted 
that it would soon also host an unwelcome guest, one that may harm the native marine ecosystem. In May 2014, Dr. Rudiger Bieler with the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago went out to dive the Vandenberg Wreck. He's a marine invertebrate biologist who specializes in mollusks. I was always interested in mollusks. I started shell collecting when I was a little boy and I kind of never stopped and turned that into a career. Well, mollusks are largely hard-shelled invertebrate animals, so they include oysters and mussels and conchs and squid and octopus and a lot of the soft-bodied animals, most of which have hard shells. Most of what we normally call seashells would fall under mollusks. The day of his dive marked the fifth anniversary of the sinking of the Vandenberg. Rudiger wanted to see what species were now living on the wreck. It was part of two other research projects. One was to get a better understanding of the biodiversity in the Florida Keys in general. And the other one was part of a long-standing research interest of mine to always look for worm snails because it's an understudied, poorly known group. Worm snails are unusual snails that permanently glue their shells to a hard surface and never move again, growing the opening of their snail-like shells into a long tube. Wherever I dive, I usually keep an eye out for worm snails. And on that particular dive on the Vandenberg, we found three specimens that were worm snails and that looked very unusual to me. He was very excited that uh, we found something and I don't know what it is. Rudiger's wife, Dr. Petra Sirvald, is also a curator at the Field Museum, specializing in terrestrial arthropods like millipedes and spiders. But she often helps Rudiger with his field work. I look for these worm snails the same way I actually look for spiders. I look for the webs. So you kind of tilt your head, try to kind of play with the light a little bit, and then I look for the reflection of the mucus threads. Similar as I look for spider drag lines in a forest. Like land snails, worm snails produce mucus. But instead of using their mucus to move around on the bottom like their air-breathing cousins, worm snails use their slime to filter feed by trapping food floating by. Mucus is involved uh, in two ways in worm snail feeding. Many mollusks use mucus in conjunction with their gills to trap particles. So the gill is not only uh, used for breathing, for respiration, but it's also used to trap particles to feed on them. Most worm snails have taken this one step further and in addition spread out the mucus directly into the environment, hang on to this mucus and with a feeding organ, haul it back in. Some media had picked up on the you know, slime net feeding procedure that these snails are using and called it the Spiderman snail. And there's something to it because they use these two arm-like extra tentacles that only worm snails have to shoot out slime threads that then entangle and form these feeding nets. But the shooting is more of an oozing happening at snail speed. The worm snails that Rudiger spotted that day were no ordinary worm snails. We noticed them right away, but I did not know what species they were because these groups need laboratory work, we need to see the living body, we need to see the color patterns, and then we usually do uh, more elaborate anatomical and DNA techniques to really nail down what they are. But in this case, I knew I had never seen them in the Keys before. There are at least 10 species of native worm snails in the Florida Keys, but a non-native worm snail can spell disaster for a coral reef community. In case of worm snails, we know that they can have negative effects on coral growth. There are studies in the Indo-Pacific that have shown that 
they're not only competing with native coral growth, but the components in the mucus can harm coral tissue. Worm snails can also carry parasitic flatworms known as blood flukes that can penetrate the skin and infect some of the marine ecosystem's most vulnerable inhabitants, such as sea turtles. So there are a lot of potential subsequent consequences of having non-native species arrive in an area. Rudiger knew he had found something he was unfamiliar with, so he sent out a sample to have the DNA analyzed. Dr. Tim Collins is a professor of biological sciences at Florida International University. His specialty is using DNA to figure out how closely two organisms are related. So we've been working together for over 20 years now. When Rudiger first discovered the unusual worm snails, he contacted Tim right away. At the time, there were three very different color morphs, and so he wasn't sure if they were three different individuals of the same species or three different species. There was a gray one, a very orange one, and then a sort of mottled one. They really, they looked quite different. We found a couple of things out immediately. One, it wasn't anything that we were familiar with in this area. And two, the, the three very different looking color morphs were actually all the same species. This is one of the, the sort of payoffs of a long, careful analysis of the fauna of a particular region as you can recognize when something new shows up. And so we could tell right away that it was something we hadn't seen before. Using a family tree, Tim discovered that this worm snail was most closely related to a Pacific species of worm snail. And since it had never been described before, Rudiger had the honor of naming it. So when we named the species, um, we had no choice in the genus name, Thylacodus, and we determined that based on study of the anatomical and molecular data, we knew it was related to other members in that genus. But we had free choice in naming the species, and we named it after the common name the scuba diving community has given to the wreck of the Vandenberg. They call it the Vandy. So it became Thylacodes vandiensis. The next question was, were these worm snails here to stay? Another dive, less than two years later, surprised Rudiger. The Vandy worm snail population had exploded. Well, during that first dive, we found three. When we went back about a year and a half later, in 2016, we found that the rails of the ship were covered in them, so we found thousands. The railings were just slime covered. I mean, they were just slime covered when we were down there. It was kind of the first indication that something was happening very fast and that they had the ability to colonize a new area very quickly. In 2017, Rudiger and Petra decided to search another nearby wreck to see if the Vandy worm snail invasion had spread. We're at the site of the Adolphus Bush, a ship that was scuttled here in 1998. So it's been 19 years since it went down, so there's a lot of growth on it at this point. Searching for a non-native species like the Vandy worm snail can be a challenge, one that Rudiger ultimately hopes he fails. I hope we won't be seeing them, but they are on the nearby Vandenberg wreck of Key West, so there's a good chance that they're here too. Non-native species can be introduced in many different ways. Sometimes animals are released from fish tanks, and sometimes they're accidentally released from the ballast water of ships. The water sucked into large ships to balance themselves. Scientists have also found non-native species floating in on debris. The best example of this was after the tsunami in Japan several years ago. We're finding species along the Pacific coast that came on flotsam, you know, pieces of pier, barges that were floating around for two or three years in the open ocean. Worm snails are organisms that 
like to sit on something hard, like oysters that we find on ship hulls, like barnacles that we find on ship hulls. Worm snails are capable of catching a ride on boats and ships. In fact, there's even a published paper that finds worm snails riding on a floating tennis shoe in the middle of the ocean. It's hard to know exactly how the Vandy worm snails first arrived. But when they did, it's possible that just one snail could have released enough larvae to start the colony. A lot of snails will dump their eggs as quickly as they can as a reaction to high stress. And if that female would have capsules that are almost ready to hatch, it probably would have accelerated the process and expelled those capsules. The mother snail broods the babies in a cavity in their body, and then the snails crawl out. They are not swimming in the plankton for longer periods like many other worm snails do. So it would have had to find another mean, either being swept on a mucus thread to a new location or being transported by somebody. So getting from one location to another one is very difficult for the species, but once it's there, it's very easy to build up a large population because they brood them in large numbers and they stay in the same place. There's a reason why, for now, Rudiger is only searching other shipwrecks for the Vandy worm snail. The natural reefs are too crowded. For any colonizing organism, you have to find an open space to settle on. And in the coral reef, under normal circumstances, most of these open spaces have already been settled by the locals. There are lots of local predators that will try to eat you. There's a lot of competition from other organisms that have similar ways of feeding. Diving conditions at both the Vandenberg and the Adolphus Bush shipwrecks can be tough, which makes this kind of search mission difficult. These artificial reefs that were deliberately scuttled off the Florida Keys are usually sitting in about 140 feet of water depth, upper deck in easy diving depth of say 90 to 100 feet. In that area, they're usually exposed to fairly strong currents. And since these animals feed in the current, they like to sit in reasonable current, but not too strong a current. And that's probably a good explanation why we find them in particular parts of the ship. Rudiger and Petra did find some suspicious worm snails on the wreck of the Adolphus bush. The worm snail that I found, I don't recognize the species now. It might be Vandy, but I have to put it under a microscope. It's okay. too small. But it is alive? It's alive. Okay, it looked dead to me, but... No, no, it might be the Vandy snail, which would be the first record on the bush. They carefully transport the worm snail back to the lab for a better look. Now it turns out it is not the Vandiensis, although the shell looks very similar, the animal looks very, very different. It's a different genus, so this should belong here, and it's a native species in the local reefs. So uh, it lives in a very similar habitat, but singly, solitarily, in contrast to the potentially invasive one that really exploded on the Vandenberg. So right now the situation on the bush is very, very different from the situation on the Vandenberg. I think it's good news because it means that the potentially invasive one has not yet spread. The presence of the Vandy worm snail on the Vandenberg has some wondering whether artificially sunk wrecks can act as an entry point for non-native species that otherwise wouldn't have anywhere to settle. Probably because it is open real estate that is not defended by local species. There are few specialized predators at the time of arrival, so it allows building up a population. I think these shipwrecks can readily serve as a stepping stone for non-native species and ultimately invasive species because it provides hard substrate in areas where there's none 
In 2017, three years since the initial discovery of the Vandy worm snail, Rudiger and Petra didn't know what they might find on the Vandenberg. Some non-native species die out on their own after an initial boom when the conditions and resources are no longer favorable for them. We found them again. They don't seem to be quite as numerous as last time, but we only seen a very small part of the wreck yet. But the species is still here. So and they're other... still here, they're still on the rails. Yeah. Where they are not standing? on the side of the ship. I yeah, didn't see them on the superstructure. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> that should give us quite a bit to do. A close inspection under the microscope confirms Rudiger's findings. Well, I will try to get a good photograph of the face, the kind of the head part and the head foot. That's where the coloration is that really gives us good morphological characters for separating different species in this group. And I can already see that this is the Vandy snail. It's definitely the non-native species. You can see both sets of tentacles and the flat foot that has no covering, no operculum that many of the other species have in the area. And here it is. So it's definitely Thylacodus vandiensis, the species we expected on the wreck. Only time will tell whether the Vandy worm snail's appearance in the Keys will lead to a harmful invasion. But Rudiger is more concerned about the bigger picture. I think the Vandy worm snail itself at least in my view, is not a great concern for the ecosystem. It's just an example of the potential of cryptic species coming in that we don't really know about. And the potential of downstream effects on the natural reef that we might not catch in time. A regular monitoring program would allow us to catch early arrivals early enough. Right now, we don't really know what kinds of little things are coming in. One way Rudiger plans to monitor incoming species is through a partnership with the Smithsonian Institution that involves a series of box-like autonomous reef monitoring structures that simulate the surface of a wreck. And these are small plastic contraptions that are maintained in the reef for a few years and then get harvested and then every animal or plant that has settled on these plates can be analyzed in a qualitative and quantitative fashion. So these units are used all over the world so we can compare the diversity of the Florida Keys to the diversity in other reefs around the world. And that gives us an idea of who's settling first, non-native species arriving on these plastic surfaces. The mysterious appearance of the Vandy worm snail highlights the importance of regular monitoring of shipwrecks and reefs for new species. The autonomous reef monitoring structures will allow Rudiger and others to carefully examine new growth in the lab and to call on experts who might be able to recognize the organisms he can't identify on his own. Considering the great diversity of invertebrate species in the Atlantic, it is no surprise that when a specialist looks at a particular area that he or she would find something unusual. And in this case, our team had looked at the molluscan diversity in the region for quite some time, and I happen to be a specialist on these weird little worm snails. So when I looked at those more closely, I recognized them as unusual. But I would think that if somebody looked more closely at the small bodied barnacles, at the little worms, at the sponges that are growing on these shipwrecks, there would be more surprises and perhaps more discoveries of non-native species. A main take home message from uh, the discovery of and description of Vandy, I think is that it shows us how fast environments can change and especially in small cryptic species these changes may go unnoticed for a very long time because nobody looks at it or is there at the right time a specialist who knows the group
may not be there and see, for example, this incredible increase in the population density of the Vandy snail within less than two years. The point is some of these are innocuous and not noticed and some may be very damaging. And the problem is these are uncontrolled experiments. We really don't know what's happening until it happens. And it's kind of like Pandora's box. Once you open it, you can't close it. And once they're here, they're here. Now what do you do with it? Try to control them or use them or live with them. Those are unknowns that probably need to be done cautiously when we think about these things. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct and Ocean Divers. The Do Unto Others Trust. The Charles N. and Eleanor Knight Lee Foundation. And by the following. <laughs>